What we're talking about tonight specifically is the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, and it, along with the sacrament of penance, or confession, both of these are known as sacraments of, of healing as well as uh, forgiveness. Uh, certainly, when we experience forgiveness in any particular way, that brings a certain amount of spiritual healing to us. And in the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, we pray not only for physical healing, but for spiritual healing as well. And we'll get into that as I move into the topic. It shouldn't be a very long class tonight, but you know how I get long-winded sometimes, so we'll see. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. <clears throat> well, the ministry of the church, which is the ministry of Christ, is to extend the healing of Christ to all the world. And in terms of all seven sacraments, baptism, confirmation, Holy Eucharist, penance, anointing of the sick, uh, holy orders, and holy matrimony, all seven of those sacraments are in effect the action of Christ through the ministry of the church in the life of the community that is the church. So we shouldn't look at, as, at sacraments simply as just nice ceremonies that we do to help us to make us feel like we're in touch with God, we should see Christ acting in all of those sacraments to continue his ministry within the life of the church collectively and within each of us individually. And part of the church's ministry of healing uh, is carried out in very specific and material ways when you stop and think about it. The Catholic Church in this country and throughout the world has one of the largest Catholic hospital networks. Uh, and the whole reason for Catholic hospitals is to extend the healing ministry of Christ and to answer the telephone. Uh, <laughs> Do you have it under control now? <laughs> okay. So the whole ministry of the churches in Catholic hospitals is to literally uh, continue the healing of Christ. Uh, and that's through doctors and nurses and, and other uh, professionals. The Catholic Church was also at, on the forefront of hospice care, end of life care of individuals so that they would be comforted and strengthened in uh, their last hours. Parish ministry is basically um, one of the keystones of parish ministry is reaching out to our sick, visiting them in the hospital uh, and helping them to experience uh, the healing of Christ. So all of these um, are very specific ways where we kind of are tapped into uh, the healing ministry of Christ so that we can experience uh, his, uh, his healing within our own lives. St. Paul tells us that when one member of the body of Christ suffers, all members suffer along with this one member. I'm sure that those of you who've had children who were very ill at one time or another uh, you felt the illness uh, yourself, you experienced it. And when they were well, you felt well yourself. I think when Pope John Paul II in his declining years and on such a public stage and you could see how weak and uh, feeble he had become because of Parkinson's disease and that the Vatican didn't hide him away, they kept him out in uh, the, the open. Uh, I think we all kind of felt the weight of, of his illness and his decline in health. In fact, I had some Protestant friends say, why do they keep him out in the open? Why don't they just hide him somewhere? I mean, it's just horrible looking at this. And I'm thinking, well, you know, <laughs> he's the Pope, and uh, he's the father of the church, you know, so we shouldn't um, try to avoid um, this phenomenon. In fact, I think the Pope was really kind of showing the world that suffering has value, and those who suffer, more importantly, have value. Whereas our culture today is kind of moving in a direction of saying suffering has no value and those who suffer have no value and so uh, if you suffer why don't you go ahead and and take the pill and put yourself to sleep or call Dr. Kevorkian or uh, let's do whatever we can to hasten your death rather than to make you feel comfortable uh, and that's that's not the Christian or Catholic way uh, of doing things so the church must use every means to alleviate, though, the suffering of people. We have to be open to medical science, which we are. Illness is also seen as a share in the suffering of Christ. This means accepting the pain that accompanies even healing. And uh, that's kind of an interesting to, thing to think about. Sometimes you do have to go through pain 
first in order to experience healing. Uh, if uh, one of our parishioners, um, he's probably in his 60s, was playing tennis uh, the other day and fell pretty badly and had a compound fracture of his arm, and uh, his wife showed me the, um, on her cell phone the uh, x-ray of this arm, and I mean, it's just bare, the bone almost came through the skin, and then there's another piece inside, and it's just kind of shattered, and they put a temporary thing on it, and he's in a lot of pain, and he had to undergo surgery this afternoon, uh, but hopefully when he wakes up in the morning, he'll be in a lot of pain, but healing will be on its way. So that's part of the phenomenon of, of suffering. The family is the small unit of a church, and it is also an extension of Christ's um, uh, healing as well. And, you know, how families do take care of their family members, and we have wonderful examples of that here in our own uh, our CIA uh, of caring for someone uh, or individuals who are chronically ill or have serious injuries that have led to uh, physical handicaps and the rest of that. The family unit pulls together to, to uh, take care of people um, in those situations. In fact, in one of the prayers that the priest uses for the anointing of the sick, and I used it yesterday for the uh, man who had surgery on his arm to set it, and this is the final prayer of the anointing, through the care of surgeons, nurses, and family members, may your servant respond to your healing will. So we see that God's healing will works through people. Uh, the family should call a priest when uh, a priest is needed for the sacraments of the church. Not only the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, which I'll talk about in a second, but also for Holy Communion if they become homebound or they're in the hospital. Uh, it, it should be a normal part of a Catholic family's regimen, so to speak, or practice to make sure the church is aware that so-and-so, my uh, loved one is having surgery tomorrow, we'd like to have him anointed. The, the man that had his arm uh, uh, worked on today came to the church yesterday uh, for the anointing of the sick. Uh, we set up a time. Or sometimes if they have more time in the hospital by the time they get there and the time of the surgery, I can go to the hospital to do it. But more and more because they're getting you in quick and getting you out even quicker, uh, a lot of times people have to call the priest before they actually enter into the hospital to uh, experience the sacrament of, of healing. So uh, all of that's part of this uh, 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 need for the family to call the church and intercede on behalf of the one who is sick to make sure the church knows that we can pray for them in general, bring them Holy Communion, and celebrate the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. In the case of serious sickness, um, the sacrament of the anointing of the sick should be celebrated, but it should not be at the point of death. Now, none of you would be in this category, but in the Catholic Church, uh, up until about 1967, 68, the sacrament of the anointing of the sick was known more as extreme unction, and it was to be celebrated or administered at the point of death. And so the family would always call the priest, not at the beginning of an illness for the anointing of the sick, but rather at the conclusion of the illness. And sometimes they'd wait until the person was hanging by a thread. And then, you know, the priest would come into uh, the hospital room and, and then give them what was called the last rites, which would include not only the anointing of the sick, but also giving them Holy Communion if they were able to receive. And that, I'll talk about what receiving Holy Communion on your deathbed is called in a few seconds. And in my first few years of being a priest, and even today to a certain extent, when a priest goes into the hospital and he's entering a room, you can hear others kind of whispering in the background, that person must be about to die. The, you know, <laughs> the priest is there. And I'm thinking, like, am I the angel of death or something? I'm here to bring... <laughs> this person the healing of Christ and uh, uh, to celebrate with them that the Lord wants them to uh, experience everlasting life. But that's unfortunately what kind of happened. And so after 1968, which is after the Second Vatican Council, the church kind of looked at the sacrament of extreme unction and how we practiced it and said, you know, maybe we need to broaden the experience of celebrating the sacrament so that the priest is called at the beginning of a serious illness rather than at the tail end of it. And that the point of the sacrament is for healing and comfort and forgiveness, not just to squeak somebody into heaven at the last minute. 
So, uh, so there's been a whole sea change in terms of the mentality that Catholics now have about the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. But a lot of older Catholics still think of, of, uh, of the sacrament of the anointing of the sick as extreme unction or the last rites. And it really should not be viewed as that. It should be viewed as just the normal care that we give to people who are, are seriously ill. Um, so what is the sacrament of the anointing of the sick? The sacrament of the anointing of the sick continues Jesus' ministry of healing. Through laying on of hands, which the priest actually does, and the anointing with the oil of the sick, which Bishop will uh, bless uh, during Holy Week, uh, Jesus himself, through the ministry of the priest, touches the sick person and brings uh, healing to the soul like a soothing ointment. So let's talk about the specific symbolism of the oil, the oil of the sick that is, is used. In fact, when the bishop blesses the oil of the sick, there's a special prayer over that indicating what its use is. Um, first of all, what do you think of when you think of oil as a healing agent? A salve. Uh, uh, it could be uh, like an ointment or, or um, what other kinds of oily things do we use for, for a balm? Uh, but what are some medications? Bengay. I mean, there's uh, all kinds of things, you know, that have a greasy feel that seep in. Neopor right, all of those. Yeah, all of that kind of stuff, you know. Um, and, and what that does, it, it seeps into the skin or into the wound to cleanse it, to bring it healing. Uh, well, that's what the Lord does. So the oil is a metaphor, if you will, for what Jesus himself does. He seeps into the very being of this person to touch the wound, uh, whether it's a physical, spiritual, or emotional wound, to bring healing. Uh, so, so, but it, so, so the oil is meant to be a sign of the risen Lord and what he is doing. Not so much that the risen Lord is like oil. Actually, oil is like the risen Lord. So, so that, in, in all of the sacraments, that's true. Uh, so that's one aspect of it. It can rejuvenate us. I used to tell people that in the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, it's like oil of Olay. I mean, it, it just brings you back to life, brings youth to the soul. Uh, so, so all of the symbolism of oil is, is very good. Um, the laying on of hands, which happens before the anointing, uh, is to call down the Holy Spirit, because this is the action of, of Christ, not of of. of the priest himself. The priest is only the means by which Christ uh, uh, is experienced in the sacrament. So it's not the priest doing it, uh, but, but Christ himself. Now the anointing normally, uh, the priest would anoint the person on the forehead and on the palms of the hand. In the older ritual prior to 1965, the priest would anoint other areas of the body, including the feet and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and it's not precluded today that the priest could anoint other areas, perhaps, uh, you know, where the, if there's a broken leg, you know, he could anoint the area where the, the wound is or, or some other part of the body. But normally, uh, the minimum is the forehead, at least, and the palms of the hands. And again, that's just to convey the healing of Christ. Throughout the Gospels, Jesus reaches out to the sick and he cured them. Healing as well as forgiveness were seen as signs of being restored to the kingdom of God. So that's why there's a connection between the sacrament of penance and anointing of the sick, because healing, when Christ does it, is being restored not just to physical and spiritual health, but being restored to heaven, to uh, the path that leads to heaven. Now, in the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, forgiveness also occurs, okay? And for that reason, only a priest or a bishop can celebrate the anointing of the sick because there is kind of a, a, a forgiveness, even apart from sacramental confession, that occurs in the sacrament of the anointing of the sick. Um, so through the sacrament, the sick are, uh, are to recognize that Christ, as well as the church, abide with them, that we care about you and we want you to experience uh, God's healing. The sacrament is meant to accomplish the healing of the person, especially spiritual healing. Therefore, sins are forgiven in this sacrament. At times, a return to physical health, 
may follow upon the celebration of this sacrament. Um, we minister to the whole person, body and soul. Now I have to tell you my own experience of celebrating the sacrament of knowing of the sick for almost 30 years now is that many times I have seen people who were at death's door uh, not expected to live through the night uh, once I anointed them they got well I mean physically well um, and those that thought those whom we thought would die that night carried on for another two or three weeks and sometimes made a full recovery um, I had a situation in Augusta at the medical college where a, a visitor to Augusta who had been to the masters had a serious heart attack uh, that caused a lot a lot of damage and I was called in to anoint her and gave her communion uh, and that she was not expected to live and then I went back the next day thinking she'd be gone and she was still alive and the husband said she's experienced some kind of miracle I mean it's not as serious as they thought it was and and the next thing you know she's being released and going home uh, and and the husband brought this big bouquet of flowers to uh, the parish that I was at in Thanksgiving for that so healing does occur and there are miraculous examples of that uh, uh, the one that I the one the most powerful example of that is uh, happened here in St. Joseph's Church in the first year that I was here uh, one of our kindergartners at the time she's now in uh, fourth grade um, uh, came down with a virus that attacked her heart and uh, it damaged her heart so severely that um, they felt that she needed a heart transplant uh, and when she was here at the medical center I was called in to anoint her because she was literally uh, on the verge of death and uh, they were flying her by helicopter from the medical center to Eggleston uh, in Atlanta so that she could get more intensive care but they did not feel that she would even make it from uh, her bed at the medical center to the helicopter let alone to Eggleston she did then they put her on a heart lung machine put her on a transplant uh, list for a new heart uh, and the the father of this child started praying to Pope John Paul II who had recently died uh, asking for a cure by praying asking for his intercession and miraculously this girl started to have a turnaround uh, and now she's in the fourth grade has not had a heart transplant doesn't need it it is on no medication whatsoever uh, for her heart situation but if a heart had become available the night that she was transferred up there or the next day she would have gotten a heart but because the heart did not become available uh, uh, there was a recovery uh, so it's interesting you know and I, I really think that there was a, a real uh, miracle involved there and on top of that uh, she was in the kindergarten and the church was closed upstairs we were renovating it so we were having mass down here and um, so we had this, we had a special mass for her with all the children at the school so they came down here and during the homily I was telling them this is a a, a mass for the healing of this child and uh, I want you to pray for a miracle I told the kids and and as soon as I said that I said thought to myself well, I'm setting these kids up for a, a huge disappointment because I didn't think she was going to live but it came out I mean even unattended unintended it came out and as you well know these children prayed for uh, their classmates so I think in addition to the anointing of the sick in addition to Pope John Paul's intercession and in addition to these children's uh, prayers that's what caused what I believe to be a true miracle to have uh, taken place so the sacrament is meant to accomplish uh, the healing of the person spiritual as well as physical healing the terminally ill who do not receive a physical healing though uh, from anointing receive spiritual help for their journey to eternity so that's very important too we pray for a recovery but we know full well that many people are not going to recover they're going to die and so the sacrament of the anointing of the sick is to prepare them for the ultimate journey that they are taking the one uh, to meet Christ at their personal judgment and hopefully to enter into uh, heaven
I've used this story in homilies before. When I was first ordained, I was visiting a woman uh, in the hospital who was very agitated every time I went in there, and I wasn't really sure what the nature of her illness was, and she was kind of rough with me and abrupt, and, and so finally the second visit I said, well, you know, we need to talk. You seem like you're not happy to see me here. And she says, well, Father, I'm excommunicated from the church. I said, oh, uh, and so she, I said, what, why do you think that? And she told me what her situation was, but that situation had long since been resolved, but she hadn't been to church in 40 years. And I said, well, you know, uh, you know, there's no reason why you can't uh, return to the full practice of the church. And then I went on and asked her, I said, well, what problem do you have? She says, I have serious heart problems, plus I have cancer now. And the doctors are telling me I'm not expected to live. And I said, well, you know, what we need to do right now is for you to go to confession, and I will do the, celebrate the sacrament of the anointing of the sick for you, and I will give you Holy Communion. And she said, Father, can I do that? I said, yes, of course you can. So she went to confession. I celebrated the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, and I gave her Holy Communion. And I mean, her demeanor changed 180, 360 degrees. Uh, she was very calm, very peaceful, and very happy. I went back to see her the next day. She di had died that night. So, so in, in a sense, the sacrament of the anointing of the sick uh, and uh, the receiving Holy Communion prepared her to embrace what the Lord was doing in her life at that time and to uh, allow her to pass uh, peacefully and safely uh, to eternal life. The biblical roots of this sacrament are found uh, in the Gospel of St. Mark. Jesus draws aside the twelve apostles and sends them off two by two with instructions for their missionary journey. They are to cast out demons, anoint with oil many who were sick, and to cure them. And in the letter of St. James, we read about the custom of the early church praying over the sick and anointing them with oil. In, Saint James, uh, in the letter of St. James, it says, Are any among you sick? They should call for the priest of the church and have then pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise them up. And anyone who has committed any sins, their sins will be forgiven them. So who may share in the sacrament of the anointing of the sick? Well, normally this, again, is reserved for people who are in full communion with the Catholic Church. But anyone with a serious disease, even or illness, even if not terminal, can celebrate the sacrament. Uh, people preparing for surgery, like the gentleman yesterday who was having surgery to set his broken arm. Um, the chronically and seriously mentally ill. So I would say people like with bipolar disorder, uh, serious, serious depression, not just the blues, but serious depression, uh, and other, you know, schizophrenia, other uh, mental illness categories. Um, and it can be also for people who, by reason of age, would like to have the sacrament, that they're, they're older and, and their health is becoming more frail because of that. Now, the sacrament is not for trivial reasons like a, a, a cold or, or um, you know, the pain that you have associated with getting a body piercing. You don't call the priest and say, I'm going to have my body pierced tomorrow, and I'm worried about this procedure, and would you come and anoint me? That's not what this is all about. Yes? <laughs> How about uh, childbirth? Childbirth as well as the child itself. Well, no, we would not anoint children who are not baptized. Uh, so baptism would be first in line. Now, childbirth, that's a good... I have, don't real, usually get requests from uh, expectant mothers unless there's some complication arising. Well, <laughs> that's why men don't give birth. <laughs> Because God knows that we would freak out. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. <laughs> but uh, what would you say with the childbirth? Pardon? It's not considered an illness. It's not an illness, but it could. The, the process, plus if it's a C-section and all that, you are having a surgical procedure. Yeah. That, but normally speaking, I think that I would go with the idea that we don't want to think of it. Pregnancy or an illness or something that needs healing. <laughs> right. Uh, so we would see that as a graced moment rather than something that's serious, you know. But of course, if there's a, a, 
a, a reason to be concerned than, than you could actually receive. Now, but again, with infants that are critically ill, baptism is the primary uh, source of, of healing. Yes? For an adult, you know, <coughs> death, you an adult have to be a Christian to be receive the sacrament? Yes. Uh, for an adult at the point of death, uh, normally this sacrament is reserved to Catholics in full communion with the church or, or, or uh, so so we would certainly pray for the person and uh, normally if the person is conscious uh, they could uh, ask to be received into the Catholic Church if they're dying and that would be appropriate and then at that point uh, it could be uh, taken care of okay even people who have lost consciousness may be anointed uh, in fact, I'm called many times to anoint non-practicing Catholics. And I always tell people that when a, a non-practicing Catholic is thinking that they can squeak into heaven by a priest coming to give them the last rites at the moment of death, that really they are playing Russian roulette with their salvation. Because what if the priest is not available to come and anoint them at the last minute? Uh, every priest is out of town or, or they die before the priest gets there. But I have been called because family members have interceded on behalf of the person who is dying and they know that this person is Catholic and they know they've not practiced the faith and they know that it's a good idea to call the priest to come and pray for somebody at the moment of death. And I'll go there and I'll anoint them and if, even if they're unconscious, the effects of Christ coming to that person is experienced by the person who is dying. And what's interesting about that is that it has occurred not because the person themselves themselves has asked for it, but others have interceded for them on their behalf. So you can see in a sense how intercessory prayer is so critical uh, for people and for all of us. Uh, that somebody had enough care and interest to call a priest to have them anointed. I had that recently. I had a funeral about two weeks ago now of a, a young man, 35, been away from the church for years and years and years into all kinds of bad things in his life and had started to come out of that, was in recovery programs and he got hit by a bi uh, on his bicycle by an automobile and by right should have been killed instantly but was not, uh, but terribly, terribly injured, uh, sent to the medical center uh, and he lived for 12 more days, never regained consciousness. Uh, parents were finally called and they realized their son was not going to make it and they called me to anoint him. Actually, it was Father Justin. And uh, Father Justin went on the 12th day of his uh, stay in that hospital, intensive care, and anointed him and one hour later he died. And the parents said it was as though he was waiting for someone to come and anoint him. Or maybe the Lord Jesus was waiting for someone to call him to go and anoint this child, this young man. We don't know. Uh, but the parents really believed that 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 uh, uh, um, that was the case. And I did the funeral. I did the funeral, Father Justin did the anointing. And I pointed that out, that this was a very uh, powerful example of the necessity of intercessory prayer and that we intercede for the need, the spiritual and uh, needs of our brothers and sisters, especially when they cannot call for that themselves. So that's very important. Father, is that a one time, like say someone's in a coma and you come to anoint them, but then their coma is not a short one, it's long term, mm -hmm. they be anointed again? Sure, you can receive the sacrament of the anointing of the sick as often as one feels that it's necessary. I, I, you know, I wouldn't do it compulsively, but, but I... If, for example, we have many people that are in intensive care in our hospitals here that are Catholic, and their dying process is a lengthy process. So let's say that it's uh, uh, over a two or three week period, sometimes even longer. I will anoint them periodically. Uh, and if family members are there, I will anoint them again, even if it was the day before or three days before, so that the family is aware that the church is praying for them and the Lord is with this person at that time. So it's, it's a judgment call as to how frequently it should be done, but it can be done repeatedly um, for individuals. Now, if they're unconscious, uh, you know, and there's some hope that the person is going to get well, you would want to bring in the big guns and make sure that, uh, you know, they get what the church allows for them. Father, what's that promise that we have that we do so many, is it uh, nine first rise or nine first Saturday, that we know a priest will be there, kind of like that 
man that was interceded for. Right, it right. Was a promise so that we all it was the pro I think it's the Fatima promise of the first nine f first Fridays. You make nine first Fridays, and the, the Lord will make sure that you die in His grace, so to speak. Uh, now, whether or not a priest will be there is another question altogether, but, but, but I can't remember the specifics of that. And that's a private revelation, so I'm not sure. Uh, uh, it's the Sacred Heart, yes, it's about the Sacred Heart. Right. Right, well, he, you never know. You never know, exactly. Now, a dead person may not be anointed. A lot of times I will get called to the hospital after the person has died and they say, can you give them the last rite? Meaning, can I do the anointing of the sick or extreme unction? I said, well, I can't anoint them, but we have prayers after death. And that's what I do, and I bless the body. And then, of course, the, I always tell people, too, that certainly we'll pray for the person in the moment of death, uh, and that's a very important time to do it because they're in transition, if you will, to their judgment day. Um, but the funeral rites of the church are prayers for de after death as well. You know, the, the vigil, uh, the night before the funeral, the funeral mass, and then the burial. So it's all really part of uh, the same package, if you will. Sometimes, though, it's hard to tell at the moment of death if somebody really has died or not. So if I have any question about it, I will err on the side of anointing the person, even though they may be dead. And, and I've had experiences where the doctor at the hospital, well, the doctor comes in and uh, says the person is dead and declares them so, and then five minutes later they take a breath. Now, I don't know what's happening. You, Jenny, you probably know what's happening at that time. Somebody and they have an agonal rhythm. The family thought they were dead and they're not. Right. Sometimes have a gasp after death and yeah. just releases air. Right. Yeah, but, but again, you don't really know what the point of death is, so it's, sometimes it's better to, on those situations, to err on the side of anointing the person rather than say, well, they're dead, I'm not going to do this. And then I say, <gasps> you know, you know, oh my God, they're alive. <laughs> so, it's, uh, yes. What is the church's views on cremation? Uh, cremation is allowed in the Catholic Church. The preference is caring for the physical body because it's a... Uh, a temple of the Holy Spirit and giving a Christian burial to the physical body. And all of that is in anticipation of the resurrection of the body when the Lord returns at the end of time. But many years ago, even uh, centuries ago, in countries where Catholicism was brought, or, or evangelization took place, like Japan and India and other places, where cremation was uh, so much a part of the culture, the religious culture, and not in opposition to anything that the Catholic Church stood for, especially the resurrection. The Church did allow for cremation in those cultures, in Japan in particular. Uh, that has been extended to anywhere in the world now, I think, uh, but certainly here in the United States where uh, cremation is an option if you so choose to have it, but it's the second option, it's not the preferred option. But we ask that if you do choose cremation, in fact, church law is that the, the ashes that remain must be given a Christian burial or entombment. Uh, and the problem that we're having in the church today, because we allow it, is that since there's no civil law saying that you have to bury the ashes, people are taking them home. And they're not giving a proper Christian burial to the, the cremains. They're putting them in a closet or an urn, keeping it on the fireplace, and, you know. Have patients still save their spouse because they don't live in the area where they die and they want to wait until they move home? Right, they'll save their spouse for, for a burial. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, I understand. Which is, yeah, but it's kind of a strange phenomenon. Because you could never do that when, when you had a body you had to bury, you didn't bring them home and say, well, embalm him really good and I'm going to keep him in the uh, basement until it's my time to go. I mean, you know, <laughs> we just wouldn't have done that, you know. Uh, yes? Well, you know, some of this was there were pagan cultures and a culture of the dead and, and zombies. these zombies. cults that were not Christian that the church was having to deal with and mm -hmm. trying to separate itself away from it too. Mm -hmm. uh, right, right. But the, 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 the problem is, that is what is happening, and I don't, when people say they're going to take the, the ashes later, I, I don't get into an argument anymore. I just make it clear to them, this is what the church expects. And then, uh, but you do lose control because there's no legal requirement to, to bury the ashes. So people have interesting ways of, it's almost, I don't know, what would you say, to keep the ashes of somebody that you love because it's a connection to them 
<laughs> Are you? Would, yeah, but is that a good, healthy psychologically and spiritually or not? Well, relics act that way. That's true. So you're saying that the church should let people bring the ashes home? Is that what you're saying? I've had to divide people up between their children. I know that's the other thing. Oh well, so and so is going to get part of the ashes, and then that, that's true. That happens all the time. Yes, absolutely. You know, so it does. It does. So it's not. It's not a healthy thing. I don't think. I think it can be in terms of, again, it, it depends on what's going on in the person because to see that in terms of reminding you to pray. You know what I mean? You should pray anyway. Yeah. But, it, but you should keep it in a place that is sacred, like a family plot in your backyard. Okay? And that's what I'm saying. It should be a sacred place, not on your mantle, okay? <laughs> so to speak. You know, you know, you know, fenced off area where Rover is and Grandma. And, uh, so, so, you know, so, so, yeah. The funeral homes they'll do it. It has a little, you know, welfare in place in it so that each grandchild can have a piece of granddad. Oh. Well, yes. Just put people's hair, you know. Hair, yeah, yeah. But it's almost like somebody, you know. I think one of the toughest things that happens after death for a family member is getting rid of their personal possessions like their clothes, okay? But you have to do that eventually, you know? Uh, it's not healthy to always keep those things. Uh, so it's a psychological thing, I think, more than a spiritual thing, but anyway. Um, so how is the sacrament celebrated? Well, as I mentioned, only a bishop or a priest may celebrate the sacrament. So uh, Deacon Mangin cannot do it as a deacon. He can baptize, he can witness marriages, and uh, proclaim the gospel, preach, and do funeral services, but not the Mass. He can't celebrate the Mass. Um, and it's done through the laying on of the hands, touch, the official prayers of the church, and then the actual anointing of the person. And what the priest says at the anointing on the forehead is, Through this holy anointing, may the Lord in his love and mercy help you with the grace of the Holy Spirit. And then he anoints the palms of their hands and saying, May the Lord who frees you from sin save you and raise you up. And then there's other prayers that are, are associated with that. Now there's two ways of doing this. It can be done privately in my office or in the church or in the hospital setting or at home. Or... Once a month, we have a communal anointing of the sick at a special Mass at 11 a.m., first Thursday of each month, and it's within the context of Mass, and then the people who are to be anointed come forward. Uh, and again, I always tell them it's, if, it's, if you're weakened or made uh, feeble by age or you have some serious illness that you're combating, chronic illness or mental illnesses, you can be uh, anointed. So we do celebrate it regularly for a regular group uh, the first uh, Thursday of every month. Now, in terms of the last rites of the church, apart from extreme unction, uh, one, of the, the, one of the things that we should also offer a person who is dying, if they're conscious and capable of doing so, is not only the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, but also to celebrate Mass for them, or if that's not possible in the setting in which they are in, to give them what is called their last communion. And the last communion is called viaticum. Let me write that out. Viaticum. It's a Latin word. And to be honest with you, I'm not sure what it means specifically, uh, but it, it, I believe it means uh, via would be food for the journey. Uh, so... Uh, it, it is the, your last Holy Communion that one receives. It is food for the journey to eternal life. It is important at the moment of death to receive the body and blood, the Holy Sacrament of Holy Communion. Viaticum truly is the last rite of the church and can be celebrated as a Mass in the hospital room if, if the person wants that or simply as Holy Communion given to them as their last communion. Uh, we should not deny a person uh, this sacrament. Now, sometimes I, I, I have to give them a very tiny particle of the host because they can't swallow, but they're conscious and understand that, and I have done that frequently. I have very seldom celebrated Mass in the presence of a person dying because it's just not practical. Uh, but you, would, you can bring Holy Communion and then give them viaticum in that regard. Now, so that would be considered a last rite. 
And, and then as the person is dying, even after I've anointed them, there's a series, a series of official prayers for, of the church that is prayed for the person that is dying. Uh, it includes the litany of the saints, scripture readings, uh, just a, a, a commendation of the person to God's loving embrace. We send them forth, if you will, and that's independent of the sacrament of anointing of the sick. And then once the person has died, there is a series of prayers for them at the hospital bed or their, their deathbed or wherever the death took place. Uh, commending the person to God's embrace and asking the angels to carry them to heaven. Um, so those would be considered the last rites in the strict uh, sense of the church, as well as the funeral rites of the church. Uh, that would be considered the last rites. So does anybody have any questions on all of that? Not quite an hour. Yes, Jeff. Uh, go ahead, uh, Jeff. Uh, if a minute Eucharist minister comes to the hospital for a sick person, kind of a surprise to give them Holy Communion, are the uh, fasting requirements still in place? Oh, well, that's a good question. Uh, when you're in the, the question is, do you have to fast uh, the hour-long fast uh, when a priest or a Eucharistic minister comes and brings you Holy Communion in the hospital? No, there is no fast whatsoever because you never know when the priest or the Eucharistic minister can come. You may have just had breakfast or lunch or eaten something, a snack. You know, everybody has food in the hospital, candy and all the rest of that. And uh, so, so none of that applies at, at all. Can't you dispense somebody from fast if it's necessary? Yeah, if it's necessary. And they do get a dispensation. Yeah, you could do that as well. Okay. Uh, I was just going to mention that um, there was, after post Vatican II, some controversy in terms of deacons anointing with oil for a while, that this was going on, and then the Vatican looked at it, and the fact that, that it was said no, that deacons couldn't do it, and laity couldn't do it, because of the tie to penance and confession. Correct. Now, in the Eastern Rite, deacons, can they do it or not? I, I'm not sure about that either. I don't yeah. think so. Yeah. So, with that I, said, I, yes. I wanted to just, yeah. you know, because we've talked about baptism. And mm -hmm. The reason, uh, because this came up recently in terms of, you know, that every Christian should be able to baptize somebody. But on the deathbed, when somebody said, because they were calling St. Joseph to come and, and to baptize, well, if somebody's unconscious and never indicated that they wanted to be baptized, my understanding is we can't do that. Correct. You should not force it on anybody. Yeah, it's right. like not respecting their autonomy. Whereas, but the difference is, if it's a child, even if the parents object, it's licit to baptize a child who is possibly going to die. Right, correct. Because they couldn't no, the consciously yeah. make the decision right. anyway. Right. So just just to clarify something, and I understood that, but I went and looked at the canon law. But I might tell you, this, this case that you just talked about, somebody calling for me to go baptize, or one of the priests to go baptize, an individual who was not Catholic, because his wife had been Catholic, and she had died years ago, um, because of the intercession of one of our parishioners, when I told her, who was the one calling me to go do this, I said, I cannot do it unless a family member asks it for it, or the man that is dying himself. And uh, so she went back and communicated this to him, and he says, call the priest. <laughs> so, so he was baptized and received uh, Holy Communion and died after that. So, so again, you know, you never know how the Holy Spirit is working through the one that is persistent in trying to get something accomplished for someone. Uh, so, so that's also very good. Yes? To follow up with this question earlier, when we get closer to the baby's due date, would we come to you for a special blessing? Well, you, yes, you can get a special blessing, certainly. Anytime when you're pregnant, there's a, a, a special blessing. And certainly as you get closer, uh, a special blessing would certainly be appropriate. But again, we wouldn't see pregnancy as a disease or an illness or anything. Is there, right. is there a blessing for Yeah, there is. The there's a special blessing. There's a book called The Book of Blessings. Mm -hmm. That anybody can get and use, mm -hmm. except yet within that is there are certain things that only a priest or deacon can do, but a lot of it the lady can use. And so it's something if you want to have it, it covers a lot of different things. Mm -hmm.